Thank you everyone for joining B2B Marketing Gap Live with me, Jade. If you don't know me, I'm a marketing coach and consultant. I specialize in all things B2B. You probably know me from TikTok or the podcast. I just thought of this topic yesterday. Really randomly, I saw a post about the cost of inaction on a blog somewhere just mentioned. And I was like, I've heard about that before. And that is really worth talking about. First of all, what is the cost of inaction. The first thing to do is to think of it as a juxtaposing concept to return on investment. So when it comes to our sales strategies and our marketing strategies, when we're talking to people about why they should buy from us, we're quite often justifying a return. Or as marketers, we're like, hey, if you invest this amount of money in our marketing, I will get you a return of this amount in our sales. So that metric is widely recognized as very effective. However, when we look at cost of inaction, COI, we can actually tell our leaders what it's going to cost the business to not invest in marketing correctly. And on the flip side of that as well, in our selling strategies, we can talk to our ideal clients about here is the cost of not doing this. Return on investment is more on a, okay, if you're going to go ahead with this money, I'm, I'm encouraging you to part with this money. And if you do part with this money, if you do it, I'm convincing you to spend the money, you're going to reap this reward. Whereas cost of inaction is going on the negative. It's much more. If you don't do this, here's what's going to happen. It's really effective for justifying marketing spend especially when it comes to tricky finance directors. So the biggest risk is missed opportunity. Let's talk about risk. So how I would define the cost of inaction, COI, is something like losses or expense to the business as a result of failing to act. So if we don't act, here's the impact. Yes, there's fears around if we do act and what could go wrong, but here's what happens if we don't act. Thinking about ROI, it really focuses on justification of cost. And so we're not saying we won't use ROI. If you work in sales or if you're the business owner yourself, you will obviously talk about return on investment. We're not just talking about the cost of not investing, but we're really justifying the cost of acting. And with COI, we are more focused on the cost of not acting. There's three prongs to this, which I find really fascinating. So we have an immediate cost of inaction. I'll give some examples in a minute. That could look like, okay, the immediate cost of inaction, if we think about marketing, is, okay, sales director, finance director, how much is a sale? $20,000. Through our marketing efforts, we would be looking to generate enough opportunities to get, let's say, just be like humble, another three sales per month, that would be 60,000 additional revenue per month. If we don't do this, that's 720,000 per year. So immediate is like, we're going to, we could lose three sales a month. Oh my gosh. It's like, okay. Yeah. That's like 720,000 pound a year. And then the future of that is yes. And as our marketing successes grow, that could look like a million in year two and 2 million in year three. So actually it's more like close to 4 million in terms of cost of inaction. The other one there is opportunity. So what opportunity would come as a result of those immediate three lost sales this month? If you had listened to the strategy recommendation six months ago and we had started our content marketing strategy or we had started investing in SEO and online advertising and retargeting, by now we could have been having these three customers. Okay, but those three customers, what is their lifetime customer value? That's the future opportunity element. But also the last one being opportunity is that of those three customers, how many might have recommended us to someone else? Actually, for every three customers we won every year, that could have been an introduction to another one customer. And so actually our cost of inaction on my proposed marketing spend is more like 7 million over the next three years. So if you're a huge hundred million pound company, that may not be a big deal, but if you're currently at one million, you need to get to five million, that could be a pretty big deal. 
And so if you're going to have conversations with your finance director, always scary, let's be honest. First of all, we want to talk to them in business language and make sure that we're not just talking marketing acronyms and things they don't understand. But when they say things like, hmm, what's the ROI going to be on this? Obviously, we're going to answer. Obviously, we're going to share some examples of how we expect to see a return. But we can also be kind of assertive back and say, hey, but let's talk about the COI. What about the COI? Huh? What do you mean? Well, we need to look at the cost of inaction. Really, it gives us ammunition as marketers to not always be on the defensive of like, justify, justify, justify. Actually flip the tables a little bit and go, but hey, what is the cost of not doing this? Not acting could be really quite damaging to us too. I really want to focus in through this session and I'm not going to spend ages talking about this because I want to whip through all of your questions. We're going to have a nice lengthy Q&A today and I'm going to really rapid fire go through all your questions and that can be to do with anything to do with b2b marketing at all it doesn't have to be about this topic if you haven't been here before the b2b marketing gap live is once a month and i always start with a bit of a topic like this just to get us all thinking and then we do like a really nice portion covering whatever you want it to be it's kind of like free consulting for you so think of your question now there are quite a lot of people on zoom today so if you want your question answered just get it in there and i'll get through as many as i can I really would love everyone here to think about this concept of cost of inaction in two ways. First of all, how it can be applied into your company's selling strategies. So how your salespeople can use it for your business and also how you as a marketer can use it to get investment that you need and to get buy-in into following marketing projects. It doesn't even necessarily need to be that you're asking for a big sum of money. It can be buy-in. For example, the salespeople are not using the CRM system properly. Oh, well, they're so busy. They've got so many meetings. They haven't got time to be updating all these silly fields all the time. It's taking way too long. Can I talk to you about the cost of inaction for that? For every meeting that's not added in, we are having different salespeople calling the same people. And that's damaging our reputation. And it's leading to fewer meetings, which is leading to fewer sales opportunities which is losing us five clients a month whatever you know it'd have to be a lot more thought out than that but that is cost of inaction you can't really show there's a return on investment to a salesperson putting a note into a crm but i think that that cost of inaction is a really nice way to get change made and so let's look at an example of a B2B consulting firm. I'm actually thinking about my husband's business. He runs a company that they're quantity surveyors. They cost jobs for building. Say you're building a hotel. His company would be the people who say, here's how much it's going to cost. And so just making up a service that he might hypothetically sell is that he wants to do a consulting report at the start of the project to say, here's all the things you're going to need to think about. And here's how to make sure that this goes to plan. And here's how to not have any gaps in what you're doing and end up at the right price. This is completely made up. That's £4,000. And the client goes, that's too expensive. Okay, so my husband might say, I don't think it's expensive. Let me talk to you about why. The issue that you can talk to you about when you're selling this is that, look, without this report, you could make loads of errors in your hotel build. It could go woefully wrong. You can't afford that type of error. The client is like, okay, well, yeah, I'm aware of those issues, but back in the, in the back of their mind, they're like, I don't care. So client aware, don't care, is a really interesting topic to think about when it's like we talk to customers about issues and they're aware that it would be better to do something that we're suggesting to them. However, they don't care. It's, it hasn't got into them. They haven't cared enough to make that change. The amount of pain of a problem that you're willing to experience versus the pain of change. So the pain of change is like, okay, I want you to invest in our software product, not someone else's. But the pain of change is higher than the pain of the problem that that buyer has with the current solution they have so they've got client aware doesn't care they're not seeing that the change would be worth their time and effort and so again this is why cost of inaction measurements can be really valuable because an ROI is kind of hard to quantify tangibly in this situation what's going to be the ROI on my four thousand pound report it's a bit like you could loosely link it to while well, you're going to sell your building for 1.2 million more than you built it for but they're going to be like well that's not because of your report that's because of the architect and everything that we've done in the building and the marketing of it however the cost of inaction to not having this report is perhaps that because they haven't sought professional advice at the start 
everything's really disorganized. It's all a mess and it's taken them six months longer. And so then my husband could hypothetically say, well, look, if it's going to take six months longer, that's six months of additional labor. And that is X, Y, Z delays costing exactly this. Like you can literally calculate it so that the cost is 400,000. So that's why you can say, look, I don't think this is expensive. Let me talk to you about why. It's really great as a selling strategy for you to pass on to your sales teams and your leadership. Another one that I was thinking about was, I know a lot of you are in tech software companies. Let's say that you have a SaaS product. So subscription as a service, simply meaning that you pay for something like I'm paying for Zoom right now. I've gone from £12 a month to £40 a month to get more people into these webinars. Let's say you've got a subscription software and that software is going to make your ideal clients, employees much more productive. And so you're really trying to sell this to them. It's going to be £40 a month per user and they have 50 users. So you're trying to close a £24,000 tech product sale. The issue you can talk to them about is like, you know what, your team is going to achieve a lot less without this tool. Client aware doesn't care. Yeah, I get it. I know we're less productive. I know we're spending loads of time. Yeah, I know it is important. I'll get to it at some point. I think 24K is too expensive. I don't think it's expensive, Mrs. Buyer. Let me talk to you about why. Talk to me about what do you pay your workers per hour? Okay, great. How long are they spending per week on carrying out this manual task. Oh, 12 hours a week. Okay, well, it's not the whole week, but that's quite a lot. There's 50 of them. Wow, that's £576,000. <laughs> so it's like the cost of inaction to not invest in this tool. Let's say it's an AI productivity tool. AI is such a great example. And the reason for that is that people don't see that the efficiencies to be made and had through AI is literally like game-changing in companies. The, the pain of change is so high to radically overhaul how we run our businesses that it's like, oh, I we don't care. I know it could be faster and better, but I'd much rather my teams manually use Excel spreadsheets and print things off and send things to each other and edit than invest in any AI productivity because I just can't see. But if someone came up to you and said, it's going to cost 25,000 and it's going to be a bit of pain of change, but the cost of inaction is 576,000 pounds a year, it's like, oh, right, okay. Whereas the ROI is more like, what's the return on investment on buying this product? I don't know. So those are a couple of examples for how you can apply cost of inaction to your selling strategies. Let's talk about marketing. Let's not talk about marketing because I deleted the slide. So let's just go off screen share and I'll just, I'll just wing it. This should be fun. I had an example for you of a marketing manager asking for 150,000 for their marketing budget. So not huge. And the finance director is like, no way. We're not increasing from 50,000 to 150,000. However, the marketing manager is like, okay, if we were to get three new customers as a result of the marketing, and then they became an annual customer spend of 50,000 each, that's 150,000 per year. That's 150,000 per month. So that's 1.8 million a year. So you can use that on the example of today. 200 people signed up for this webinar. I started these webinars 14 months ago. And on my first webinar, five people registered and two people showed up. On my second webinar a month later, six people registered, one showed up. So they basically just had a free one-to-one. -one. It was no problem. And then it just started going up to 10 and 12. And then for a while I had 30 and it was like eight would come. And I was like, this is just group coaching. This is not really like brand building for me. And so after a while, it just started to build and momentum was going up and up and up. And then eventually it's like, okay, I've got consistently over a hundred people registering for my webinars. And I think why that's so important to say is that it's not just about marketing investment. It's also about the cost of inaction around things like brand building. A year ago, I launched my TikTok, actually a very similar amount of time ago, about 14 months ago, I launched my TikTok. I said to my husband, I said, in about a year, I'm going to start getting brand deals from this. I'm going to start having a lot of clients come through this. I can see it in my mind what I need to do to get to that place. The motivation was very high and the strategy was very clear. 
If you were to scroll back, please don't, to my 2022 early TikToks, your, your blood would go funny. It's really cringe. Like I'm getting used to the platform. To be honest, everyone was a bit cringe early 2022. So like, it's okay. I was following the culture of the platform. I was learning it. I was, you know, testing things, working out what worked. And every month my content would get better and better and better. When you think about the fact that 90% of my company's revenue now comes from TikTok, the cost of inaction, if I'd given up on TikTok in those early days, so I tried it consistently for two months, I wasn't giving up. It was never in my mind that I was giving up. But it was really, I didn't have a single customer from TikTok for about six months. And now I get to a place where I have to actually close my doors because I can't have any more. And so it's that consistent approach to your brand building efforts and marketing strategies. I'm a massive advocate of selecting two or three core strategies for your business. Maybe it's your company or maybe you're doing the marketing for the company you're in. Pick in two or three in line with a set strategy. And I'm going to tell you about something very cool that's launching soon that's going to help you with selecting these in a minute. Select those two or three things that have been selected based on going through a strategic process and then firmly go for it with them. Consistent, persistent, quality, lined up majorly with your ideal client and what they care about. Building in that cost of inaction factor as well. You can't afford to not do this and really thinking about what those things are. One of the most successful online marketers that I have taken much inspiration from and I credit like the progress my business has made is a woman called Latasha James. She is one of the most consistent, persistent people I have ever met. She, for the last probably six years, has posted three well-edited YouTube videos every week without fail. No matter how demotivated she feels or how much her content inspiration is lacking, which is very rare, she always posts them. So I think it might be two videos maybe be one these days, but it was always two when I first found her. No matter what, that happens. And she now has something like 180,000 YouTube subscribers. She makes six, multiple six figures from YouTube ads. She makes six figures, maybe even seven figures in course sales. She's like so successful. And her message is, this is not about me being more talented than you, even though she is a very talented person. She's like, the only reason I'm able to so these results is just my absolute unwavering commitment to consistency. And the reason I talk about this is that in B2B, the biggest reason we're not getting results is, is first of all, that there isn't a strategic approach. Second of all, that we're not lining up closely enough with pain points. We're not actually talking about stuff that our ideal audience would genuinely care about and would genuinely help them. A little bit like if you reflect on why you're here, my guess is that many of you have hopefully found some of my content useful and helpful. So you're now giving an hour of your time to listen to me because you find it helpful. But if I just put out content about a very minuscule element of SEO that's not really anything to do with me and I'm not as knowledgeable by any stretch as a person who specializes in SEO, there's no way you'd have been interested and drawn to my content. So that is my biggest message is to... Make sure that what you put out in your content strategy is is definitely going to help the people that you sell to. But but really, I'll give you a great example again of a company I was working with. They were putting out content really regularly about industry reports to do with this sector. They were in quite a complex sector that was heavy, you know, these B2B sectors that are really heavy and full on. And they were putting out these quarterly market reports, which were really useful to their ideal client. People were downloading them. It was great. But what it wasn't doing was actually building them up in the areas that they want their customers to regard them well and pick them over the competitors. So what I had them do, I just said to them, write down the 10 questions that you're asked most frequently by people when they ring you. Like when they ring you with a problem, what are they saying? What are they asking you about and what are you helping them with? And then literally, so right on 12, months one, we're asking question one, months two, we're asking question two, months three, we're asking question four. That's my content strategy. I literally talk about things that people ask me. So 
I can get up to 1500 comments a month on TikTok. And I just think about what are people asking me this month? Okay, everyone wants to know what the marketing budget should be. My content plan for February is marketing budgets, how to set them. And that's how to build a good content engine. I think there's such an overwhelm of over-intellectualized marketing advice out there that we end up completely paralyzed by models and concepts. And actually it's like, what are our customers struggling with? And how can we point out to them that we would definitely be better at helping them with that than, than someone else they've been speaking to? What frustrations have they had with what they've tried in the past? And how can we talk to them about that? A good example, again, for my business is most of the people who ring me or not, no one rings anyone anymore, do they? <laughs> most of the people who Instagram me or LinkedIn me, that is a really millennial thing to say, isn't it? Um, people who text me, they all start by saying, hey, Jade, I need to understand why we're not getting results from our marketing. And I'll be like, what have you tried? And then I find out all the frustrations with things they've tried in the past, which then informs my content strategy. So I can say, here's six reasons you haven't been seeing results from your marketing. You're mismanaging agencies. You don't have a strategy. You keep hiring marketing managers and expecting them to be senior and strategic. I basically replay the frustrations they're having. I really love the idea of keeping it simple. So if you can have the pain points nailed, the two or three strategies defined, let's say your strategies. And by the way, this is so doable because I do this as a person who works on my own with absolutely zero support externally. There is a topic selected per month. There is a podcast every two weeks. And off the back of that podcast, there is three blog articles. So maybe there's three major points that were covered in the podcast episode. And we're creating three blogs. You can even use a tool like Descript to rip the transcription from the podcast and then literally say to ChatGPT, using only the words in the podcast transcript, please create three blogs for me. And then what that does is it literally uses your subject matter experts exact words to create compelling blogs. It's a good starting point. You could say we're going to have a blog a week, one podcast every two weeks, two blogs from each of those podcasts. All of a sudden, you've got four blogs a month and two podcast episodes. And maybe you get some kit and turn it into a video podcast, which means you've now got a YouTube channel. And then you're going to use a snipping tool like Descript. Descript is unbelievable if anyone ever wants a demo I think I'll do one you upload your video say you interviewed your subject matter expert in your company if you're a marketer or maybe you're the owner of the company and you have got lots of knowledge and your marketing person or your assistant interviews you you just press play get them to not freak out don't worry about the fact that this is content everything's going to be edited I just want to talk to you ask them a few questions about the subject so, okay, let's say it's that construction company I was talking about, my husband's business. One of the questions I might ask him, and by the way, I am making him do this in the next few months, would be, tell me the biggest reasons why buildings are coming out over budget. What happens with him is the first two questions, he's really awkward and he doesn't like it, but after a while he gets into a flow. And what I like to say to him, because he's the director of the company, is you feel really uncomfortable because you've got this idea in your head that we're creating content once I can get you into the mindset that you're just talking to an ideal client about their problems, which we know from feedback that you are absolutely amazing at, your clients are like, he knows everything inside out about this issue. Once I can tap into that part of you, I'm going to get gold. So then I take all of that footage that I've created. I go into Descript. I tidy it all up. I download the audio and put it on the podcast. I download the video and I put it on YouTube. Then I go into a tool and it throws out eight snippets that you can use for LinkedIn posts and you can use for Instagram posts or TikToks, short form video. And then you write posts that add to it. And then in comment, you just put like, this is my literal marketing strategy. In comments, you write, watch the full podcast interview here, listen here, simple as. And then from that, your other thing might be, okay, we're going to get a lead magnet. And I know there's a lot of people who want to hate on lead magnets, but I'm sorry, I would like to have data for people so that we can encourage them to buy from us. It's really simple. So your lead magnet could be something like this, a live expertise webinar. If you're in a law firm, that can be really great. If people have got challenges, you can talk to them about things they need to consider, about commercial law or whatever it is. Or your lead magnet could be a really help, genuinely helpful guide you know, that's going to support them or a link to a free training, something like that. So having that type of strategy and then consistently sticking to it, 
and really firmly getting your business to believe in it and go, this is going to take a bit of time and we aren't going to stop doing other things that are going to be more directly tangible, immediate results. If you have an email list, you need to be marketing to those people. You need to be getting sales to follow up. So things like that. I don't know why I went off on that tangent then, but I hope that was useful, that little kind of chat. But it was just to make the point about consistency being everything and the cost of inaction. You know, people launch a podcast and then they do two episodes and then they just never do it again. Oh, well, no one listened to it. I had like four listens to my first few podcast episodes, but I just kept going, kept going. And now it's, it's really listened to and getting reviews and people sharing it. So it takes time. The point I want to end on before I jump into the questions, I really have been laying awake recently worrying about B2B marketing. <laughs> should I this is really sad but like I keep worrying about it as a discipline I think that it's going through such a radical shift and I think what's happened is companies are just not seeing it I I speak to so many businesses who are like we're doing the calling we're doing the outbound and we're just not getting the customers we're not getting the customers it must be the market and then next year's like oh it must be this it must be that and I'm like I don't think that's what it is. I think how people buy has changed. And I've had hate on TikTok about this, but I don't care. Like I haven't got, I don't sell anything that would mean that I make more money based on people believing what I think. And there'll be marketing gurus in books who say things in the 60s. And it was like, yeah, well, his model was completely flawed, but there was some interest in stuff. So I'm happy to be one of those people who's like, I reckon this, but maybe it's got holes in its thinking. But people buy from those they trust and I think that what we could we all need to do is really focus on how do we build that long-term brand building engine that gets people to see us as an expert where our competitors are not while of course not giving up on being active with our sales and on our emails and things like that Whew, cool questions let's see tiktok I'm getting sent loads of roses if anyone wants to tell me what that means Okay, so someone says, digital marketer held hostage by IT operating like it's the 90s. The 90s. I love the 90s. Okay, question. Our new marketing hire is insisting that organic reach is more important. I want to make the argument that we are missing sales. It sounds like we've got someone here who believes that paid social is the best and someone here who believes that organic social is the best. And I wouldn't be able to say here which one is right. What I can say is that it feels like there might be a strategy missing because a strategic plan takes away that kind of like he said, she says debate. We understand because of our annual strategy lays out the role of organic and paid. My personal view is that organic performing content needs to be first and what performs you then boost that. I'll give you a good example. I had a video go viral on TikTok that was me in a hoodie and looking fairly scruffy. Someone had asked me a question and I just casually replied because I was really passionate about the topic and it went viral, had hundreds of questions, thousands of likes, third of a million views, all that stuff. That performed well. I don't do any social ads at all. If I wanted to sell my course in the future, I probably would if I wanted to boost that. But what I'm going to do is on my content calendar for this month, I'm remaking that exact video with high production. So it will look smart, professional. I'll have a call to action at the end. Because again, the cost of inaction, that viral video didn't have a call to action on it. There was nothing to say download my report or listen to my podcast which may not seem like a very tangible call to action but when I direct people to my podcast if it goes viral I get about five clients per viral video actually like in the door closed because they've listened to the podcast and they've come on a webinar then they've booked in to work with me so I lost the cost of inaction for not including a call to action on a video was well let's work it out an immediate one if they all had one strategy call. So that would be five times 1250, but most clients have about 10. So, oh my God, I'm going to be sick. So my cost of inaction for that TikTok video is 12 and a half thousand pounds for a three month period. And then if you decide to say that actually they would have referred me to a couple of people, maybe that's like another 25,000. This is how the cost of inaction works. And so thinking about that, I would say that it, so what you want to really look at is like, yes, if reach is down 188%, but what was the return on spend? 
from that. It says since his takeover, sales are down 250,000 year on year. Right, okay. Maybe we've got a marketer making changes. If we can directly correlate that with like that change meant this, that could be a problem. So yeah, I would need to know more about it, but it would be interesting to know if that £250,000 sales going down, is that directly linked to the Instagram and Facebook ads or is it more to do with, okay, we're not closing as many deals because X, Y, and Z. Annabelle says, I'm trying to emphasize the importance of having a CRM system. However, the current system doesn't work with third-party CRM system software and the sales team won't use another system for implementing data. What options do I have to try and gather data to analyze customer leads? This one is super common. What stands out to me most here is sales won't. And that links to a culture issue. So what we want to work on is getting leadership on board with making sure they have a clear business strategy and understand the cost of inaction on these types of issues. Having salespeople rule the roost is never a good idea. If they're just refusing point blank to do things, this just can't carry on. What matters is what is in the best interest of the business. So your leadership team need to be bought into fixing this challenge. And you can drive that by alerting them to the cost of inaction on the different areas of your systems. It sounds to me like you need a systems specialist, tech software guru type consultant to help you look at. And I always recommend people to look at what is the offline flow of how our company works what happens from the client's perspective there's a client when we win them what happens and what happens to them next and we onboard how do we look after them how do we get feedback from them how does all that work offline forget about the systems for a minute and then a really good system software specialist will so not like a person who works at a CRM company a person who is probably in the past been very senior within a large enterprise and they know how all these things work and they've implemented multiple softwares in-house and they're like a bit of a, a guru we need to get them to look at all those offline processes look at what's there and kind of audit it a bit and try and make use of what you have there will be times when one of those guys will say you are not fit for purpose unfortunately you invested in a tool that wasn't future fit sorry to hear it but that's the reality you can do two things. You can carry on what you're doing with this system you have right now that is not compatible with anything else that you need. And you can do that and the cost will be nothing. However, the cost of inaction will be massive and you can demonstrate that. However, if you want to overhaul all of this, it's going to be quite a lot. It's going to be a £250,000 project over the next two years. However, if you're on a growth plan to achieve X, Y, Z, the return you should likely see from doing this is better flowing, more customers, all of that stuff. That's how I would approach that. I would go up to leadership. Salespeople shouldn't be calling the shots on what they will or won't use. And then it comes to like softer skills with management. If you've got a salesman say, well, I'm not doing that. There's an analogy where you have a bus and the bus has a route. If everyone's sitting on the bus, we get from A to B. Are you on the bus? Are you off the bus? You know, this is where we're going. Come on in. Hey, Julia. She says, how can we convince senior leadership to stop caring so much about vanity metrics? For example, number of followers doesn't in any way relate to sales. Yeah. So a lot of marketers reports and I've done this. So this is not me passing judgment at all, because a lot of the time when we're not set up to be strategic, we end up creating non-strategic reports. So it's easy to, because vanity metrics, we're not going to say they're not important. I would consider them to be success indicators. So say you had a goal to get to 10 new customers. So if I know that to get 10 new customers, the success indicators for me would be, wow, my content is performing really well. If consistently my content has been getting like 30 likes consistently for the last month, Whilst that is a vanity metric and it doesn't matter that much, I know that that's a lot lower than it usually is, where some will get 1,000, some will get 500, some will get 200, some will get 50. It's a metric that's important because I know that it does indicate that I'm on track to success. And the same with emails. If I send out emails, if I get a 70% open rate on an email, I'm like, yeah, that's definitely going to lead to 
more of an outcome than if it was going to get 10% open rate. And it's making sure that we have an awareness of the difference. If leadership are obsessed with that, it's probably because they don't see marketing as strategic. They don't realize that marketing is more than just social media posts. And I know you know all this, Julia, because you're like super awesome at marketing. It's really getting it across to them. Marketing today is about driving growth. And for us to do that, we need to be strategic. And so we need the investment to do that. It's really just educating them to understand that it really doesn't matter how many likes we get. But again, that said, if we're only getting two likes and one comment from an employee on content, it might be that we're just not putting things out that people are interested in. So helping them understand that it's not wrong to care about that stuff, but it's definitely not the only thing. Okay, I work for a product manufacturer and the main line of business is enterprise B2B. Our marketing team has been held back by our IT group who undermines tech advances, even ones that were standard 10 years ago. So we have people manually entering orders into our system instead of IT reporting data that already exists. How do I demonstrate that continuing to let this subpar support slide is going to kill the business? For example, I've been asking for a replatform for our website for two years now and basic infrastructure is never sexy enough to address. Okay, basically in a nutshell, you need to advance your marketing tech and IT are holding you back. Really good questions. I am a bit more blunt these days with marketers in that I'm like, look, we don't want to get too upset about this sort of stuff in that we are going to do our best in a company to make change. But at the same time, if the door isn't going to open even a crack, we then have to have the conversation with ourselves to weigh up, is this good for my career? And is this what I want out of my time as a marketer? I'm never an advocate for like, oh, just get a new job. But if you've tried everything and there is not the support there, on such a fundamental area such as your website. You know, the website is the central hub of the marketing. You have to have a website that can work today. You you just can't do anything without that. I would recommend really looking at how you can get them educated. Have one big try, one, one more try to get this across. You can use the cost of inaction type metrics. If you're saying that you've been trying and asking for two years, Unless there's a maybe a missed opportunity in how you've been trying to present that, it is about thinking about long term, is this what I want for my career? If I have a company come in through the door to work with me and everything I recommend, they're just like, oh yeah, no, but we're not going to do that. It's like, it's not even a bad thing. You don't want to do the stuff that I specialize in recommending. So there's not much point us working together because it's not going to go very far. Really similar. It doesn't have to be bad blood. You guys want to stay in the past. Here's the cost of inaction metrics for that. Here's the limitations to your business model. I'm trying to help you here. I find that in these types of situations, using we instead of I can be really useful rather than saying I need the investment to make a website because otherwise I can't do my job and I can't demonstrate ROI. You can say things like if we want to see growth in our company sustainably and we would like this, we will need this. You're just the person in the business who happens to be holding the marketing experience and expertise. And so if people aren't going to want to listen to that, you've actually done your job because you're there to advise and guide. But if you're not being listened to, for me, that sucks the soul out of me. I can't operate like that. Maybe have a think about any other approaches you could try. Maybe you could calculate cost of inaction, like you said about the manually inputting data. Work that out, you know, figure it out. Jade, hey, hey, Ross, great to see you. Do you record to TikTok within TikTok or edit from your computer and upload to TikTok? Yeah, so another one I've been laying awake about So I have always been, and if you follow me on TikTok, you've probably seen that my content can vary in quality and that like what I love about the platform is the culture can be quite scrappy. So sometimes I will just grab my camera and just say what I'm thinking and post. But now that I'm doing more on, on brand deals as well, I'm noticing that when I do actually hone my ideas onto a sheet of paper and just really like get the camera out and have more of a filming afternoon, I actually do think they perform better. That said... My best ever performing videos have always been the high emotion in the moment, grab the camera in the car. It's really strange. The best performing video I've ever had. I'd actually been 
to the hospital to see a friend and it really like it hit me and people have been complaining about really trivial things at work which are not trivial to us obviously but it just hit me so hard and I just pressed play and said look you're not going to feel like this forever I promise it's going to get better it feels so bad it's not as bad as we think and it did explode because of that raw emotion so I think there is two things but to get to your question my best recommendation would be to film outside of TikTok, the quality is just better and edit using the captions app with the AI captions generator, which is really nice because it bolds certain words. What I would also recommend is getting really clever about how the box cuts things off because I see all the time people put their headings too high. TikTok is really bad for, so you might have your captions, say this is the phone, my screen is the phone, you might have your captions here, but once it's posted, it's like, Ross, your friend in Glasgow, and then the info. And so you can't see the caption. So I try and keep them kind of like just under my chin so that there's plenty of room below and also making sure they don't go so wide that they're hidden behind the follow me comment like thing. The biggest recommendation I have for anyone interested in TikTok is use Descript for editing the video, film the video, upload it to Descript, select the magic editor tool. I will do a video demo one day if anyone's interested that says shrink any word gaps to below 0.2 seconds. So if you go on my TikTok, you'll see there are no millennial pauses. If anyone has heard of the millennial pause, let me know in comments. The millennial pause is where people press play and then they go, hi. So pause and apparently from a generation perspective, it's because millennials we don't trust technology. So when we were kids, if you pressed play on something, it would take quite a long time for it to actually start. Whereas Gen Z, who are a lot younger than me, they just trust the tech. So if they press play, they're not looking to make sure it's recording. So I know I do this. I do it. I press play. I check it's playing. So I trim out all of that. And in between sentences, I trim out any pauses. And I also edit out any ums, any kind of like, oh, the other thing to consider. When I send out the replay, if you listen to it, it'll have been edited in the script. Loads of what I just said will be gone because it's just words I'm just babbling on about. Oh, hi, Laurie. So good to see you. Do you try to keep your podcast to a certain length of time? Yeah, I do. I think that if it's a really meaty topic, like how to create a B2B marketing strategy step by step, I'm pretty happy that I could get away with like a 35 minute episode. You could argue an hour would be fine, but I think that's more like a webinar tutorial, I think, like on video. I think 35 minutes is the longest that I feel happy with. I've got some that are longer, but I just feel a bit unhappy with them. I feel like it's wrong. I think an excellent length for a podcast episode is 17 minutes. I don't know about anyone else who listens to podcasts here, but when I see, when I'm scrolling through episode lengths, if there's a topic that catches my eye, how to win more clients, 17 minutes long, I'm like, play. Because I know on my average drive, I can listen to two things. But if it says 48 minutes, I'm a bit like, oh, I'm going to have to listen to it in three drives, you know. So yeah, 17 minutes, 25 minutes is probably the perfect length because 17 is fairly short. 25 minutes is a lovely episode. 35 minutes is more on the long side. And 45 minutes, I think you really need to be given more value. But lots of people will have different views on that. That's just for me. Hey, Eleanor. How lovely. How do you implement bias psychology when creating your content strategy? Yeah. So like the template I'm going to send afterwards is just really looking at the, the symptoms they're facing, frustrations they're feeling. So in that template, that should really help you, Eleanor, I think, because the template I'm going to send after is in a few different sections. It's got difficulties. But I don't know about you, if you guys have noticed this, but I never, ever use marketing words. I like to use human language, typical marketing models I don't love. So I'm making my own on everything I do at the moment. And I'm going to be releasing my course quite soon. So if anyone wants to get on the wait list, you'll get an early bird discount and notifications. In fact, you can go to the link in my bio on any of my social platforms, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn. If you click on the bio, there'll be a course wait list. So that template will be on there and loads of other ones. But... I like to keep it simple. So it's step one, difficulties. And I just say in that template, list down the 10 questions that your clients ask you when in crisis. 
say say a lead comes in the door we're really struggling with what are they saying that's one of your questions how do I get to whatever they're saying that's another one list all those then symptoms is like if you're ill you have bronchitis your symptom is you're coughing so what are the symptoms they're facing what's happening for them and then I've just got feelings how do they feel as a result of this it's super important and there's examples in there around feelings can be frustration they can be fear and even terror I'll lose my job if I get this wrong this is such a big spend it can be apprehension it can be skepticism these feelings are so big in b2b and so then I help you to come out with okay what have they tried and then what is the better way so prove it that we have the better way it's a nice exercise I think you'll find useful okay Nisreen great to see you we're looking to get a new CRM system that will help with marketing and retargeting. What point should I look when considering one? And do you have recommendations? I would recommend hiring a CRM and data strategist consultant. You can have a look for one of these on somewhere like Upwork. Look for CRM strategist, someone who can help you decide what you need and how to implement your lead scoring, your data strategy, because CRM software companies are really good at saying why they're great. But there's often gaps. They leave it to you as to how you're supposed to set it up. They'll show you a product demo, but they won't show you, okay, I've designed your workflow and I've set it up for you. I would suggest fighting for budget to pay someone like that. When I worked at um, a massive PLC, one of the biggest companies in the world, we were bringing in a new multi-million pound CRM software and they were like, oh, you need to build the flow of how we'll use this. And I was just like, flat out, no. There's certain things in my career where I just say I'm not doing it because I can't. I actually can't. And from by me agreeing to take that on, I will mess it up. The cost of inaction is huge. So sorry, guys, we have to get a specialist here because I can't build a, a CRM system that's meant to cover so many departments in terms of like the sales and marketing flows. I think depending on your business, I know that for small, medium operations, products like Insightly, and pipe drive are really good maybe for the bigger companies and then you've also got hubspot salesforce maybe a bit more expensive have a little look around read articles like what are the best for your type of customers so would this presentation be made available yes i just need to go into descript and edit it down and it will be on the podcast and the youtube so it will get circulated Julia says, thank you so much. Thank you. It's so lovely. Julia actually sent me some really cool things that she'd been working on. I have this budget calculator thing that I use with people to say, here's how much you should spend on your marketing. But I'm always using the calculator every time. And she actually built a sliding tool. And I was so blown away. Julia, I'd love to reconnect with you again about that. It was so cool. Laurie says, thank you so much for another great session. I'm going to be starting my 2024 year plan and would love it if you did a presentation on best practices for planning out the year ahead. That is so cool because we're going to finish in a second. And literally for those people who need to start planning in January, I've got a course coming out soon. It's going to be for sale. So if you want to get on that list, there's a link that's just landed in your inbox and you can press it and get added to the wait list. It's going to help you to create a marketing strategy for your company. It's also going to help you making a case for getting investment, all those sorts of things. It's going to be the piece of work I'm most proud of ever because I've never been particularly academic marketer. I'm quite fast paced. I like to crack on with things, but I've had to sit down, create templates, film content, you know, write instructions, develop modules. It's been really hard work, but I'm getting there. I think that could be really useful for you, Laurie, is to have a look at the elements of that. Great to hear that Laurie's registering right now. Leaving inspired. Oh, Lise, it's so good to see you. One of my absolute favorite clients of all time is on here, which is so nice to see your smiling face. And so, yeah, feeling inspired, looking forward to the course. Yeah, amazing. Looking forward to our next session as well. So our next event is on Wednesday, 11th of October. I think loads of you are already registered, but if you're not you can go to the link in my bio and you can register for my next event. I forgot about the guys on TikTok, so I'm going to head over to their questions. This is officially finished, but like always, I run over. So anyone who is happy just to carry on listening, fine. I'm just going to check any TikTok questions. There was once a time when my tech was going horribly wrong to the point where I hadn't plugged my headphones in, so I couldn't hear that I was on mute. And so 
one of my closest contacts who was on the Zoom knew that I was also on TikTok and the chat wasn't popping up for some reason. And she was like, came on TikTok as well and was like, Jade, we can't hear you. So I was like, thank you so much. Okay. Questions on TikTok. How critical are case studies or white papers for B2B tech companies? That's a great question. Tech companies get really obsessed with creating these because obviously you need to and use case examples and things like that. I think what matters more than the creation of them is how good the quality of them, i.e. how much are they demonstrating an actual problem that has been solved or are they just laying out something that has been done just as a tick box exercise? So if we're like, okay, we need five case studies this month and we just do them rather than taking a real problem and what was ha- what happened and the results of that. So making sure that the case studies that you profile are definitely lined up with your ideal client and what they're going through. And you talk about the pain points, the issues, the frustrations, the feelings, what you did and then what that meant for that company. I think they're really important to justify your place in the mind of the customer, but also not forgetting about brand positioning because really we want our case studies to get across, not just the hygiene factors. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of hygiene factors in brand and marketing. Two areas is hygiene factors and motivators and hygiene factors are the things that are expected. When you buy a car, you expect it to have a windscreen is an expectation. It's a hygiene factor. B2B companies are not very good at recognizing that hygiene factors are not exciting in their marketing messaging. Imagine going to Toyota and they're like, our cars have windscreens. This is what a lot of B2B companies, we are experts in accounting. It's a hygiene factor. If you're an accountancy firm, I expect you to be an expert at that. What I want to find is the motivator. A motivator is something that encourages you to purchase from that company instead of the others. A motivator might be in a car, for example, some kind of amazing feature like my friend's new car. The She doesn't have to look down to a screen. Her windscreen literally, t- the glass shows her the speed she's going at and stuff. So it's a motivator, like, whoa, that's cool. And I've not seen that in another car. In our case studies, we do need to be highlighting anything that we're doing that the competitor isn't, or just claiming it in more clear language that they aren't using. And then in terms of white papers, I would say that think of white papers as just part of a content strategy. Your content strategy needs to be really well planned out in line with your strategy. And your strategy is simply how are we going to help this company achieve what it needs to achieve? Some companies might say, we've got so much work, we can't handle it, and we don't have enough people in the business. So the marketing challenge is how do we attract really great people with a brilliant employer brand, and how do we reduce manual time that it takes to service our customers, and how do we optimize our customers' experience so we don't lose them when we're under-resourced? Most companies focus on growth, but I'm just giving an example that it doesn't have to be that. Your content plan should be directly linked to how is our content going to directly deliver on one of our marketing objectives? For example, my content plan could be my vision as a business is I want to see a world. So the vision is like where you see the business in the future and how the world is going to look when you're finished with it. It should be quite lofty. My vision for the world when I'm done with it is possibly not even realistic for me to do on my own, but it's my vision. It's what I would love to see the world look like when I'm finished with it is that B2B marketers are regarded and respected as the people responsible for growth in companies. I don't think in B2B, I don't think that is the case now. And I would love to see that world be a reality. So we're not like saying I can definitely achieve that where everyone in the world who's a B2B marketer is highly regarded and respected in their company as the growth driver, but it's what I'm working to. So in my content, it's like, how do I help make that world a reality? Well, I'm going to have to empower marketers to become that person. So I might give them tips on assertiveness and I might get them to stand up to sales and fight for their place in the boardroom. My content is linked to my vision. And then my mission, so your mission is like, Again, I don't like fluffy words. Mission is so important. Mission is literally, vision is where do we see the world when we're finished with it? What are we doing this for? Where do we need to get to? Mission is, what are we here to do? 
You think about the word mission. If you and 10 of your friends were going to live on an island for a month, your mission daily is going to be, we got to eat, we got to look after ourselves, we got to make sure we're, we're sleeping, that we're warm. That's the mission. The vision might be, we're going to turn this into a livable island and bring 100 friends with us. But it doesn't really matter if we don't achieve it now. The mission is imperative. We have to keep going. And so my mission is I help B2B marketers be more strategic and assertive, hence being more successful in their roles. So if someone asks me to do something for them that doesn't line up with helping with that, I just don't do it because I'm not upholding my mission. My energy shouldn't go there. If someone asked me to go on a podcast and talk about HR, it's like, well, no, because that's not going to help marketers become more strategic and assertive. Everything I do is to uphold the mission and same with my content. When it comes to case studies and white papers, just make sure that you don't go off on a tangent talking about stuff that people won't care about because that's really tricky. I'm going to do a couple more things now that TikTok's kicking off and then I'm going to have to go because my kids will be back soon from school and I need to get everything sorted. How would you go about setting up a social media strategy for a software company? You need to select your pillar platforms first. So don't be tempted to be on everything. There's nothing wrong with the presence on everything. But for example, I've binned off Twitter now because it just doesn't do anything for me. I know it would if I put effort in or X. It talks my pillar platform. That's where my energy goes into. That's where my audience is. In LinkedIn is my secondary platform where I repurpose onto and I get good engagement there too and then Instagram is like my shop window I need to really my game on Instagram because I'm not that great it's part of my strategy people go from TikTok to Instagram to figure out what you're about and learn about your services so I need to up my game there so that's part of my strategy pick your pillar platform where are your audience spending their time where does your subject matter expert feel comfortable what culture matches with you? So TikTok has a culture, Instagram has a culture, LinkedIn has a culture, what works for you? Then pick your long form and short form. Long form could be, we do blogs, we do podcasts, we do videos, long form videos. And then pick your short form, that's TikTok videos or Instagram carousels, whatever it is. And just really make a plan that's consistent to go in, okay, we do one podcast per week. We do two TikToks per day. I know this sounds mental, right? But in 2006, I made 100 calls a day to get two demos, to get one sale. Content is our sales engine now, in my opinion, in many businesses. I'm not saying you have to do two posts a day, but I think people underestimate how much content is needed. That said, if you're repurposing, like today, I should be able to get loads and loads of content out of this. What I've done from downloading the TikTok live, it's me talking on camera with the audio. I should be able to snip this down into at least 15 TikTok videos. Repurposing is going to be your friend. Thank you everyone for being here. I hope to see you on the next one. And don't forget to get onto the course waitlist. You can find that in a link in my bio. The course is going to launch soon. Everyone on that list is going to get exclusive updates and you will also get the early bird discount to buy it when we launch which is something I've been so excited for I've been asked to create a course for over a year I've been actively talking about maybe doing it for about six months and now I'm really excited about giving some people what they're asking for hope you have a great rest of your day everyone bye